Hey, uh, we're going to be going over, as time allows, two cents of materials. And what time doesn't allow, we'll, we'll uh, finish on uh, Thursday. Um, the first set of materials relate to um, completing uh, a topic we have been discussing um, over the past few lectures. Uh, we started our March 27th lecture, uh, continued on. And it basically concerns the uh, reification of pipelines within uh, Spark. Um, so within Spark, we can build up pipelines, which uh, capture as an abstraction um, uh, sets of pre-processing uh, data conditioning steps um, and then uh, uh, data uh, fitting steps for a model or, um, uh, or transformation steps in addition. Um, uh, that that can take place uh, when working with data, and it captures them in pipelines. It captures this as a as an explicit object, a pipeline object. Um, and by so doing, we can then use that object for many purposes. So the same uh, variants of this object uh, are used on the one hand for uh, for training, for example, on the other hand for um, for testing. Uh, of these pipelines. And it turns out they'll be used for cross-validation as well. So today we're going to be um, looking at sort of the final components of that where we're using these pipelines and, and pipeline models. So a pipeline captures an estimator uh, together with pre-processing steps for it. We can fit it to data and then we get a transformer and specifically we get a model transformer, a model that takes data in and puts data out. Um, and it turns out that with those, those uh, pipelines and pipeline um, models um, that result from fitting, we're going to be using them in the course of uh, cross-validation. So we're going to uh, be able to identify the model which offers the greatest, the most competitive uh, cross-validation performance, competitive in the sense that that according to some metric we specify, in our case it's going to be an area under the ROC curve, under the receiver operating characteristic curve, this model is the most efficacious. And it's most efficacious across many, many, all the different folds of cross-validation, tenfold, twofold, or whatever. Um, and more than that, more than just using it for cross-validation in this automated way, in a way that doesn't force us to manually re, re, redo the transformations of data, but rather just it's all packaged up in one pipeline, pipeline model. In addition, we're going to be able to vary parameters um, um, that are used as part of the, um, the estimators or models um, uh, in a very um, general way. So we might vary three sets of parameters, look at all different combinations of the regularization parameter, the um, a parameter related to the um, sort of the bias term, and some other third parameter. And uh, we find with cross-validation the best, uh, the most competitive model for, for amongst all those different possibilities. So we'll see that today using um, uh, using pipelines. And as such, we'll build on our previous pipeline work. As time allows, and I'm not sure it will today, we're gonna go on to discuss uh, asynchronous operations within the context of Spark, specifically looking at Scala futures, and then seeing how those translate in Spark into uh, future actions, okay? Um, so we'll have um, the ability to manipulate these promises of values and, um, and do so in a way that's cancelable for future values. Okay, so that's where we're going. Um, and uh, I'm going to therefore switch over to my screen share. And if someone could just verify the, uh, the sound, that would be great. Okay. Um, so... Um, we're going to go to our Zeppelin. If you haven't started Zeppelin, I'd like you to do so. Um, and 
Sounds good. Um, having started Zeppelin, um, uh, we're going to go back to material that we've been covering in our past uh, most recent lectures. Um, so there's this uh, March 27th in class session. This is, as I recall, this has been material that we've hit on in the past two times that we've been here. Um, and I need to sort of re-execute this just because it, um, I had to shut down um, the uh, Zeppelin uh, in between, but I'll use that to rehearse. So basically what's going on here is that um, we were uh, adding uh, a set of libraries that we're going to be using. Okay, where is the ethernet cable? Here it is. Um, I've realized I'm not online and I need to be, I probably should just connect with Wi-Fi, but it's a bit slow. Okay. Um, so the older one is Spark ML Lib. This is Spark ML. We're using Spark ML. I then brought down some data um, to my local machine, not because that was needed to open it at all, but because I want to read as a CSV and Spark 2.1 doesn't support it directly, reading from a URL as a CSV. So for convenience, I just brought it down there. I then loaded in two sets of tweets, um, some that are health related, some that are not health related. Um, I uh, noted that they only contain one column, um, this uh, C0 common a column, which is for text. So I then added a label column. So for the health related tweets, I had a label column labeling one. That's the feature column. It indicates this is a health tweet. And for the others, I labeled it zero. I also did some renaming there. Um, uh, and uh, we noted that uh, these tweets have many components um, uh, and uh, not all of them are uh, with the best of uh, most proper of English, I might note, as you hadn't can attest from having read many, many of them. Um, uh, then what I did is I combined them into a single data set. So I took, uh, now that they've been labeled, we don't have to worry about them getting mixed up. Um, I took them into a single data set and I, more than that, uh, that was a text a data a data frame it was a data set with simply a row here. Um, and by imposing some statement of known structure in the form of a case class, I was able to render it as a data set that's typed. So it's a data set of labeled tweet. Um, I then subsequently filtered them, say, uh, mumble, um, okay, this should be DS. I don't know why that's still there. It should be DS alt, alt tweets. Um, the next one is correct. This one is it was the previous one I just deleted was wrong. Here we could say how many tweets have this. And the key thing is the type of it is statically known. So it knows set up that it has a label thing rather than just dealing with it with a string name for its uh, field. Okay. Um, I then split the tweets. This is towards sort of uh, manual cross-validation, I, uh, I split them. Now, well, the important thing is we're gonna be doing this on an automatic basis. Here I'm doing it manually. And for two sets of data, if we only have a split into you know, two subsets, um, this is very convenient to do. Um, if we have many subsets and then we have to successively examine its performance with respect to different subsets, for training in different subsets for testing, such as as you do in n full cross validation, it's not going to be so convenient. We just did this manually to show it, um, to concentrate on other features, and I noted that there's uh, that in, for example, the first uh, subset, there's 44 of these um, of these labeled uh, one. Um, okay, then we defined a set of transformers. The idea was we're building up a pipeline. Um, and the pipeline reflects the fact that when we process data in machine learning or other analytic processes, it's very, it's, it's comparatively rare we just use a data item directly. Rather, we, we have to 
uh, prepare it. We have to do data conditioning. We have to do data standardization, for example, or normalization. We have to um, do data cleaning. We have to remove certain irrelevant components. Um, we have to canonicalize, like capitalize uh, all the words. We have to eliminate duplicates. These are very common tasks in machine learning. And Spark ML provides a set of transformers that makes that really quite easy to do. And I mentioned some in my slides. Um, here, we're just applying a set of them. So there was a word splitter, which split it into pieces. Um, and uh, this was a transformer. It was a tokenizer transformer. And as a transformer, it takes in a data set and it puts out a data set. So it directly takes in this data set, it transforms it and puts out another one, right? Um, and so we, we had a, um, a set of text here that was in, um, in full strings um, and, and it, it broke it up into pieces. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even guess what some of these are, um, but uh, you know, coughed my cough and it turned it into, um, turned it into particular words. Okay, um, okay, next, um, uh, trivial word remover uh, was a transformer. Uh, here, we, um, uh, we uh, specify which fields are input, which fields are output. I, know, I should have noted that's what we did above, which are input, which are output. Um, and uh, the input ones are tokens, and it's going to create one called significant words. So when it runs, it's going to have uh, created something called significant words. Whoa, okay, uh, all significant words. Um, uh, oh, uh, here. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Um, so this brought this down to health simply. Coughed my cough turned into coughed cough, cough, which sounds plausibly health related. Um, B is super sick, turned it into B super sick. It eliminated sort of small <laughs> trivial words and weighted noted. How does it know what's trivial? Well, in this case, it, it uh, uses a built-in set of sense of what are most common English words that are not particularly specific to topic. Um, okay, map words to present vector. Now this was different from the above. Who can remember why was this one different from the above? From the ones above. The tokenizer and the trivial word remover, those shared a characteristic that this does not. What's, what's different about this count vectorizer? What's different is that that's an estimator. It's creating an estimator. So it can't do its job unless it is fitted to data. It cannot do its job. It doesn't, it doesn't know what words you're dealing with. So how can, it, how can it define how to build vectors of words if it doesn't know what the, vo the full vocabulary of words are? What are the possible words out there? So it can put each in a specific index of the vector. So vector index zero might be for the word cough. Index one might be for the word sick. Index two might be for the word hospital. Index three might be for the word hair. Um, index four might be for the word sneeze. And five for the word computer. And, and it's going to be classifying a given bag of words, a given sort of set of words, it's going to be classifying them according to the vectorizer. So for each group of these words, it's going to turn into a vector where it's going to be one or zero for the most part. I, it, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it, when, when you have more than one of a given word, if it can be two. In any case, it's going to be a vector where non-zero elements are indicating the presence of that word and zero elements are indicating the absence of that word, right? So it's denoting the set of words associated with it. It potentially counts as well. I'd, I'd have to check. Okay, so in order for that to work, we have to fit it to tell it, hey, these are the words that I want you to associate with your vector, okay? Now, 
Having done that, what do we get out when we fit an estimator? Speak in glorious unison. Okay, well, some people say silence is glorious, so. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I guess I can't object too badly. But what do we get out when we fit an estimator? We get out a transformer. That's right. It's not Optimus Prime, but it's um, it, it's a it's a transformer. And this transformer's job in life is to take in data sets of words of of delineated words, just like we had above these sort of data sets, and then it's going to put out a what? It give you a hint. It begins with a V. It begins with a V and it ends with an R. <laughs> a vector that indicates with one or zero whether it's uh, present or not or or or, or a count. Um, I think it's uh, maybe count, but in any case. So here you go. And um, you could see, for example, this one um, has. Um, has only word, okay, no, that's, that's kind of interesting, because um, I would have I would have expected all of these to be uh, represented there. But uh, this one, for example, um, has, has uh, it seems, one significant word in it. And I'd have to, oh, okay, I think it's just cut off here. Um, uh, and I think this says um, uh, basically a hundred, a hundred. Could this be a hundred three different words? I should I should know this. But uh, index one five and eighty seven contain the value one point zero. Um, I have to be careful with this one or three. That's pro. Oh, I know what that is. What is that? Of course. What is that? Anyone? Okay, well, setting a, a lack of clarity, this is the length of the vector. That's the length. And this specifies indices that hold this value. So here, 35 and 85 hold two. Others may hold one. Um, the entire vectors of length 103, eight and 60, 61 here hold 1.0, et cetera, okay? Um, and you'll notice there's some in common, like 87 holds one here, 87 holds one there. And I'm guessing that, therefore, if we really were to look into it, these two have some word in common. Okay. Um, similarly, eight is here, is in both of these guys. So this is a sparse vector. It's not storing every index naively as zero, one, or two, or whatever, and just totally get up. Rather, it it knows that most entries are what? Zero. Zero. And so it's not bothering to store them. It's just bothering to store the ones that are not zero. Okay. Now it turns out in other lectures you'll find from me online, I think I turned these into regular vectors at some point to show how they can be rendered into a vector. And I have code to do that if anyone's interested. So you can pull out a vector which would show the, the various entries in it. But um, that's not for today. Okay, so so what I did then is I created, okay, now what, what is this? I created a logistic regression. And notice that I set some parameters. These are gonna come back, if not to haunt us, then at least to visit us as an apparition. So what are, what are, what are, what is this thing that I've created here? Yeah, it's a logistic regression. I won't object to that answer. But what it, what sort of thing is it? Is it a transformer? Is it an estimator? What do you think? Can it, if I give it some data, can it immediately give me data out? No. No. What does it need to be done? What needs to be done to it? It needs to be fit. It needs to be fitted, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, but rather than fitting it directly, which we could have done, um, I fitted it in the context of a pipeline. 
if, if I had fitted this directly, what would it have required as input? I mean, after all, if I said here, logistic regression dot fit, if I, if I had done this, I didn't, but if I had said logistic regression dot fit, right? What would it need as input? Yeah, it would need it would need a, a vector. It would need it would need a data set of vectors, I should say. A data set of vectors. Um and uh that's that's not something that um uh that I have in the raw data. Rather, I'd have to process I'd have to give it the results of several stages of processing, namely these, you know, uh, tokenize some sentences and turn them into significant words, and then and then uh, transform those into vectors, and then I could give it. So rather than doing that manually and sort of saying, okay, this requires vectors from my original data sources, I package it up. I package it up into a um, into a pipeline. And that pipeline captures the entire abstraction. It captures the fact that to use this, to use it to, um, excuse me, I have to define it here. To use it to, to um, be trained or to use it to be applied to some data, the, the resulting model, or to use it to be cross-validated, I need to, in every point, I need to go through the same steps. So this packages it up as an abstraction. And, you know, you'll have to take it from me if if you can't sense it yourself, that that's a thing of beauty. Um, so having done that, we can then fit the whole pipeline. What sort of data is this? The S labeled subset. What sort of data is that that goes into the pipeline? Well, you may remember from earlier, but I can show it to you. Well, amongst other things, I could say print schema here, right? Boom. This is just label. What's the label? Yeah, it's a double. And what what does it signify? What's its meaning? One or zero? Yeah. Is it is it health related or not? This was the actual text. Remember that. This is the feature here, okay? Um, or the label, rather. It's the label. What am I saying? It's the label here. Okay, so here, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, a pipeline coming out. Now, this pipeline uh, uh, that came out of this, what is that? That's a what? So if we fit a pipeline, a pipeline is an estimator. You notice this is an estimator. If we put it together in these stages, it's an estimator. The pipeline as a whole is an estimator. If we fit it, what do we get out? Speak as in one, as in a Greek chorus. We get a transformer out. Yeah. And in fact, it's a specific type of transformer called a model. Okay. Great. Great. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, here we've got a transformer out. And as a transformer, it can transform. So it can take in data and it can produce data. Right? It can produce data. And what is the data that it produces? Well, it includes the results of this uh, logistic regression pipeline and applying the logistic regression as parameters we set up there. So let's go and we'll, we'll look at this. Here we go, transform this. Here we go, we applied it to this data and we got out some data. And you'll notice that it included some extra components. This DS labeled subset that it took in had only these. This data that it put out has a set of other things besides that. Which of these are new columns? Can you tell me? Which of these are new columns? All the text and label. All but these. So the tokens. Where did the whence did those come? Those came from the from the word splitter. 
Yeah, the tokenizer. Where is the tokenizer in this whole thing? Well, it is located in the pipeline. So it annotated it along the way with that. Where did significant words come from? The stop word remover. That's another part of the pipeline here, right? right? And it's another part of the pipeline, right? Okay, um, where did the features come from? Yeah, the features came from this vectorizer that we trained to know about the vocabulary up, up here, right? Okay, so it created those columns, okay. Okay, um, I created the, the the features of this. So what did the regression create itself? Yeah, it created this raw prediction, this probability assessment, and and this sort of final one or zero prediction, okay? Um, uh, where where it classified it. The raw prediction, as I recall, varies. It's kind of a kind of an internal model specific sort of statement. You you can I think you can go get information about some of its interpretation, but generally you're looking at the probability and the prediction. The prediction is if it had to come down on one side or the other, what is it? The probability assesses, okay, how confident is it about it being health related? And, um, so this one here, it's pretty confident it's health related, whereas this one, it's less, it's less uh, confident uh, that it's uh, it's health related. Okay, um, and uh, uh, these are um, uh, these are sort of classifications that it's using um, uh, for these. Okay, let's let's continue to go on here. Um, so we then defined an evaluator and this evaluator um, was designed to evaluate how well it performed. Okay, how well our classifier performed in light of the fact that we have a ground truth label, as well as a, a probability prediction. Um, and so we asked it, how well did it perform? Now, what's notable is that we asked it to perform under area under ROC curve. So this is area under the receiver operating characteristic. So we defined this evaluator and, and then we asked it to evaluate. Now, this number that it came up with, um, uh, this number that it 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 came out with, uh, that number reflects the fact of an area on an ROC curve where the ROC curve exhibits differing trade-offs between sensitivity and specificity or precision and recall, depending how you want to frame it, um, as you go along the x-axis. So in an ROC curve, we are characterizing um, the ways in which as we vary, you can think of it either way, as we vary sensitivity, how does the specificity change? Or as we vary specificity, how does the sensitivity change, okay? And um, we're hoping for something which, uh, which can achieve high sensitivity and specificity at the same time. Um, so it picks up a lot of true cases, and when it says something's a case, it really is genuinely a case. Um, and in order to come up with this number, it's using different cut points to judge what is health related and what is not health related in terms of the underlying probabilities. It's not simply using the prediction here, it's using these underlying probabilities. Okay, so uh, here we're not doing so bad. I would note that in doing this, because it's gonna be important when we're coming back here, we are training it only on a subset of the data and then we are applying it to the other subset. Do you remember that? This was half the data and we're applying it to the other subset. So we're training it on one part 
and then applying it to the other, and it still does okay. It still does okay. It's not nothing to write home about. Um, if this were 0.5, it wouldn't. It would be pretty unimpressive. Um, be a coin flip sort of situation if we had equal balance between them. Um, but um, we've done not bad. Uh, the problem is, as we'll see, that we've sort of packed a lot of assumptions into this logistic regression that we might want to change. So coming out of um, uh, coming out of this, um, we were able to look at the pipeline model, and in some of our work, we went and looked at the stages, and we looked at the Paran map that it created. We saw what our assumptions are going into it, and I noted that that there's a set of assumptions here, like the regularization parameter, the maximum number of iterations, the uh, tolerance, I believe, that that we sort of specified. We then looked at sort of what the coefficients were associated with uh, with this model. Um, oh, I should have. Uh, should have emphasized here, right. So we had fit this and we had, um, uh, so, so this logistic re regression model pipeline or uh, pipeline model that we got, this was something that we had fit back here. Uh, it just came from a single model. So the fact that this says best LR model is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually not the best. Soon we're gonna see the best, or it's gonna see the best of a set of choices. This is actually not the best. It should really be called um, LR model instead of best LR model, because that that sort of, um, that makes it sound bigger, better than it is. This is not so, this is just one LR model that we came up with by fitting it. It's not particularly privileged. It's not particularly strong. Okay, we're gonna look, we looked at its coefficients. Those coefficients, where did these come from? We talked about it last time. Where did those come from, those coefficients? Sorry? From the, from the model. And specifically from the logistic regression model. So those correspond to the beta coefficients in the logistic regression. And they basically specify how associated with a positive outcome are different here, what does each of these correspond to? A different what? Word, word. And so some are negatively, what would it mean if it's negatively associated with it like that? How associated with it is with it being health related? What would it mean if it's negative? Suggestive that it's not. It's not health related, right. So again, like rough riders or, engine or <laughs> you know um um i don't I, I i don't know you know uh uh i'm, I'm lacking uh you know smartphone or something <laughs> i don't know i don't know um okay and then if it's strongly health related it would have a, a, a positive coefficient that could be quite large okay um and I noted that there were a lot of those coefficients. Um, uh, here we go. Can they be large or are they limited in like minus one, plus one or something? They can be, they, they range from. The plus one, or point no, eight. Works. Yeah, they can range from oh, yeah. minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. Because the, the form of the logistic regression model, um, let's see if I have something about bag of tricks. Um, uh, right, it fits a minus infinity plus infinity to a zero. That, that's, that's right. So, so there's this transformation that's based on an exponent. Um, uh, man. Um, Okay, I, I have my bag of tricks in my office. Um, uh, so, unfortunately, I don't have it here. But um, it, basically, there's an exponent of beta zero plus beta one times, in this case, it would be x one, which is basically 
one or zero, presence or absence of a certain word, plus beta two times x two, where again, x one, x two, et cetera, are so-called dummy variables, they're either zero or one. If that word is present, one, otherwise zero. Um, and the betas here, because it's e to the, to this, uh, this whole thing, they can be as large as possible. If they're, if they're really, really negative, then it's gonna be, you know, e to the, say minus something and it's going to be one over e which is going to be one over e of the something and that's going to be close to zero if it's very positive it'll be uh uh it'll be uh very uh a very uh high high value and on the left hand side it's going to be low g to p um uh which is uh which is going to uh excuse me it's low g to p equals beta zero plus beta and one x one, and so it turns out that that's that's going to allow it's transformed in a way the p the probability goes between zero and one, but these beta coefficients can go between non infinity and plus infinity. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, sure. Now you'll notice that there's a hundred three of these coefficients. Why is that significant? Where did we see the hundred three before? It was the length of the vectors. There were hundred three possible what? Begins with a W, ends with a D, or ends with an S, and then a DS. Yeah, words. Okay, okay, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So in the final model, so they won't consider whether each of the words is significant or not, like all the way through stepwise regression, right? Remove some of the words. Correct. And I believe here, this is a very good question whether they so my interpretation originally was that they do not perform stepwise regression in other words what you is alluding to uh if i understood a correct or question correctly is that in in best practices for logistic regression you're not going to just be throwing all covariates into the final model you're going to be only throwing covariate you're only going to be including covariates which prove important as judged by a set of tests and the set of tests involve in in current best practices involve two things number one in a unit variant model if you if you just examine that one by itself is it significantly predictive of of the outcome if if that's all you're considering is it is it uh significantly predictive um so it is a p-value of less than 0.05 um the second thing that's used today is is it um, is it uh, something that is an important confounder of something that is is uh, is significant? And sometimes people put something in there. I've, I've heard statisticians also talk about putting it in if there's some theoretical justification for it. But um, I thought that it was. It was just considering all of them in there. But then there was something that I saw recently that made me wonder. I still, though, I, I haven't been, I'm still pretty confident it's still including all of them. So it's not going through that automatically for you. Right. Oh, I think that would be a good practice. It just, it doesn't do it automatically for you. It just, you would have to do that yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, num, uh, this is the number of active uh, coefficients there. And uh, by the way, you had, this is something per your question. I'm wondering if this active coefficients, it, yes, exactly. It, it may be that you can set as part of your param map, your sort of set of parameterizations here that you somehow want to it to prune or something like that um i i don't see anything that obviously indicates that but um but the fact that it's called active coefficients made me wonder okay um and then we saw particular words that were that were larger um and i also saw how we can um find out what the vocabulary here is um 
and uh, basically um, we were able to um, uh, we were able to find you know what was the most predictive uh, element here and and then here I looked at some that are are quite predictive. Um, it's not clear why um, why those are highly predictive, but uh, you know we we did some others and uh, illness. Okay, would go. <laughs> I think there's a bit of overfitting going on here, probably. Like would we'll go to the hospital or something, but. Um, but illness is 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 reasonably explanatory, um, and uh, yeah, um, okay, um, okay. So that's where we were at, and that's where we left it off. And I've re-executed that, um, and then we saw some that are not that are not highly <laughs> predictive, which for some reason included a man. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to now uh, continue on this to include some other things. Um, so specifically, we're going to automate um, some of this process so as to, uh, to allow us to find a model which relaxes these assumptions. Because at this juncture, we have committed to very specific assumptions here. It's not obvious where, but if you go up, we specified right here a set of these assumptions. We specified a certain number of iterations, a certain use of the regularization parameter and tolerance, and we may not have been, we may have given our first guess, but we weren't sure that those would be best. And we could, of course, manually go and uh, alter those guesses and see how we do. But there's a much much better uh, way to do it. So we're going to put in place something which will allow us to do two things. One is we're going to be able to vary these assumptions or a specified subset of them as we choose to allow for testing our model over a variety of tolerances and regularization parameters. Um, secondly, as part of doing that efficiently, we're going to be testing this, the resulting models, not just based on two subcomponents of the model, not just based on subset one and subset two, training it on subset one, um, judging it on subset two. Um, rather, we're going to train it on a wide variety of different subsets. We're going to perform n-fold cross-validation. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, so we're going to select different values of parameters and judge each according to n-fold cross-validation, and we'll then report the best model across all. Okay, here we go. So we're going to do the following. We'll say val param grid for logistic, I'll, I'll abbreviate this, log, LR cross validation, okay? So this is logistic regression. And what this will provide is a way of building a parameter grid, okay? New param grid builder. And this is going to add in add grid we're going to add a grid of guess what params okay so these params each is going to specify characteristics of the logistic regression what's quite nice is that we're going to be able to do this in a way that is going to specify which parameter we're going to vary, namely the reg param. Where did this logistic regression come from? Well, it came from way up, uh, way up here, where we had a logistic regression 
there. See that? Logistic regression. And so it's part of the pipeline. So for the regularization parameter as part of this, let's get this up here. Um, we're going to put in place an array of possible values. 0 0.05, 0 0.020, 0 0.40, 0 0.6, 0.8, and we're going to close close that one and close that one. So we, we've added a grid here with respect to different values of regularization parameter to use. Next, we're going to add another grid for the same basic logistic regression element to the pipeline here. Oop, add grid, sorry, not add grid, logistic regression, add grid. And it's logistic regression dot tolerance, T-O-L. And it's going to be an array of 0 0.001, 0 0.01, and 0 0.1, varying by a factor of 10 each. Okay, and then we're going to say build. This is going to create a param grid. Okay, so param grid builder. Oh, should be a capital B. There we are. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here we just created a parameter grid. This parameter grid systematically varies two sets of parameters, this one and this one. So how many elements is it gonna have? Can anyone guess? Yes, 15 indeed. Five for each of these, three for each of these, all cross products. So it's a Cartesian product of all of them. Okay, um, so that's good. Um, uh, that's uh, that's a good thing. Um, and that's gonna be a parameter grid. And we're going to use that with cross validation, okay? Um, so, um, what we're going to do here is to do the following. We'll say val cross validator for logistic regression, okay? This is gonna be a new cross validator. So it's gonna be a cross validator. Now, the cross validator needs two key pieces of information to do its job. Does anyone want to hazard a guess? If, if you were a cross validator, what things would you need to do your job? Hmm? Size. Okay. Yeah, number of folds is, is good. I'll say three key things. Okay, the model. The model that's uh, that's used. In this case, it will be a, will it be a model? Uh, so I want to I want to remember how, so remember in in Spark, we speak about model as a type of transformer. A model's job in life is to take in data and output data. And I distinguish that from an estimator. What does an estimator do? Before we can give it data, before it can act as a transformer, what does it need? It needs to be fitted. It needs to be fitted, okay? And in Spark terminology, Spark parlance, that fitting process is what produces a model. So what do we need in cross-validation? Do we need a model? Do we need a, tra a transformer? Estimator. We need an estimator because why do we need an estimator? We're going to fit the model to different subsets of that, ten, of that data. We're going to do tenfold cross-validation. So we're going to use, you know, nine-tenths of it for, say, for fitting, for fitting the model. In other words, for training the model and one tenth for evaluating and then we're going to go to another nine tenths and use and evaluate against the remaining one 
the another nine tenths value against the remaining one, and keep on doing these things um, so that we uh, so that we develop confidence as to how how well um, uh, our estimator is really going to be performing here, right? Based on we abstract away from the vagaries of on which subset we actually trained it, and we say we want we want an estimator that's going to perform really well, you know, across all these different folds of the cross validation. So it needs it's a good thought. It you might think informally it needs a model, but but really it it needs an estimator that when fitted can produce a model. Mm -hmm. mm. What else does it need? So, so the folds is good, but what else? There's one more thing. Okay, so we're going to be applying it to a data set. It's true. It turns out that's not built in yet for the cross validator. We can apply it to a data set. But I'll tell you, it needs a way of evaluating this. Like how evaluation, uh, evaluation method. Yeah, evaluation metric. And, okay, so this is what we're going to provide. We're going to... For the cross validators, we're going to set the estimator. And the estimator here is going to be an estimator that we've worked with. Because we want to apply this to raw data. So guess what is needed before it can apply an estimator? If we apply it to raw data consisting of a bunch of strings from collected from Twitter and classified by UN, what 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 uh what is what is um if if that's it's going to be the input for the cross validator what does it need to do before before we can like apply a logistic regression it needs to do transformation of that data right it needs to tokenize it, it needs to remove stop words and it needs to vectorize it right Mm. So, and then it needs to perform the cross validation, right? Is that right? So, what thing does all of those? A pipeline, ladies and gentlemen, the pipeline, the logistic regression pipeline. It does all of those things, it does the whole shebang. Hmm? It's the big kahuna. Okay. Um, next, we're going to set the evaluator. And this is going to be, guess what? The binary classification evaluator. Okay. For some reason, it's not doing autocomplete. But do you remember when we defined that above? Do you remember that? Binary classification evaluator? Remember that? It's, it's not entirely indicative um, of confidence. But, um, okay, binary classification evaluator. And next, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to right. Um, we're going to uh, set the estimator RAM maps here, okay? And this will be based on this param grid, okay? Um, this param grid that we just defined, okay? Param grid for LR cross validation. This thing we just defined. So that's going to tell us how to, what things to vary when we're, and for each of them, we're going to perform a cross validation to judge them. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, finally, we're going to set the number of folds to be 10. You notice this very, functional style. Each of these um, provides something. It Each of these sort of 
takes that and uh, changes uh, and sort of returns a thing with that set, returning back another object, which is then sort of processed by this operator. This is a pipeline, just like so many pipelines we've seen in functional programming. It just sort of processes it along. So here's our cross-validator. This is an abstraction that captures the cross-validation. And it captures cross-validation in a tenfold way, where for each different subset of 10 subsets of the data, we're going to be taking, taking nine-tenths of it, we're gonna be performing logistic regression training, we're gonna be training this pipeline on that. In other words, fitting the pipeline on that. We're gonna get out a model whose performance on the remaining component, we're going to judge using this evaluator. And we're doing that for each of these values of the param grid that we just saw. We're varying that, right? Okay, so let's, this is our cross validator. It's doing a lot of work. It's doing this different transformations, of the data, it's, it's, it's quite a lot that it's capturing there. Oops, I, I, I did something bad. I misspelled that. There we are, it's a regression, not RR R, R regression. Um, Okay, uh, so now we're going to say val cross validation results for logistic regression. You can do LR if you want to. And this is the cross validator for logistic regression dot fit. There we go. Where are we gonna fit it to? In this grand culmination, what are we going to fit this to? Are we going to fit it to the data that's already turned into a vector? Are we going to fit it to different subsets of the data? Man, maybe one of my internet users can send an answer. <laughs> What's that? We're gonna, so, sorry? Yeah, from the raw data and all of the raw data. Why? Because it's doing the slicing and dicing for the different cross-validation components for us. We don't have to worry about that. We give it the whole shebang. The, the, the full shebang? The whole kahuna? <laughs> um, the, yeah. Um, we give it the full thing here, okay? Um, and it's doing some work, as you might expect. It's working. It's engaged in, what is it doing now? Well, for each of these combinations, all 15 of them, it's doing work. And, and what is it doing for each of those 15? It's doing uh, cross-validation against different slicing and dicing the data in different 10 different ways and for each doing a a, a a fit and then evaluating that fit across an roc curve which requires reasoning about how the sensitivity and specificity change for different values of of um well, if you change sensitivity how do you how do you change specificity for example or vice versa right yeah um so it's actually doing a fair bit of work. And it probably leveraged, you know, all of my cores in the process, et cetera, dividing up different, uh, uh, different elements of the work. Okay, so we've just gotten our results. Let's go take a look at the, um, at the, the quality of the results, okay? Um, I'm going to say cross validation results for logistic regression dot average metrics. Okay. Average metrics. Here we go. Boom. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Now, what is this? What thing lies before us? What, what do you think each of those numbers means? Well, let's take a look at their size, right? 15, what do you think each of those mean? 
Yes, for for each combination of parameter values, right? For each combination of parameter values, how well did it perform? Okay. Um, now here, the differences between them are, I would characterize as modest and potentially in the range of, of sort of noise. We have on the upper side, you know, 8143, something like that. Um, in the lower side, it's like 997 or 796, something 797, right? Something like that. So it's it's quite modest ranges associated with those uh, parameter values. Uh, perhaps I didn't vary them as, as widely as I should have. Um, perhaps I should have expanded certain areas, but that's exactly the point. It's quite easy for you to go back and, and just define these to you know have more below 0 0.015 or something like that, and you just rerun it and find that. Okay, now let's find, ladies and gentlemen, the best model, okay? Um, okay, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to take a val logistic regression, logistic regression model from cross-validation. And this is going to equal the cross-validation results here for logistic regression. And we're going to say dot, and guess what? Guess what? It's not um, actually doing the autocomplete properly. It's called, sorry, best model. That sounds encouraging, right? Um, now, if we just take the best model, we'll see that it's a, it's kind of an opaque thing. All it knows is that it's a model, right? Um, and so we want to tell, you know, this, this is, this is a pipeline model. It's not any logic model. It's a pipeline model. It'd be pretty neat for it, not any logic model, but um, as instance of, and we will say pipeline model. Okay, here we go. So now we get back uh, a pipeline model. Okay, um, and now having said that, how would we figure out what its parameter values are? Does anyone remember? Above, does anyone remember how we could look at its, we could ask for its Paran map. Remember we had an LR model? This wasn't a best model, it was just any old model who we got. Remember that? When we fit it to different subsets of the data? Now we've got something much more special than that. We've got a best model. But we could still say dot extract. Oh, sorry. Mumble. Um, okay. Um, okay. So this is interesting. I actually say. Um, okay. Let me let me just try extract parent map. I I think this will actually cause a problem if we just do it. Uh, directly, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah, see, I can't find that directly, but I could say dot parent dot um, paran map. Okay, and now, now it's it's actually got a uh, paran map uh, associated with that. Um, and this paran map um, is for the, the stages of the pipeline overall. And I'm I'm curious by why it's not uh, showing more information on that. Oh, it's because it looks like I need to write this. So when I say, take a look at this, this log logistic regression pipeline model, I took the third stage of it 
as a logistic regression model, and then I extracted its paran map here. What what sort of um, what sort of model is this down down here? Um, I said logistic regression model, but really it's a it's a pipeline model, ladies and gentlemen. So to really um, to really get this, I think we would actually need to reach in to, okay, so this is, okay, that's the estimator. I've gotta be, gotta be careful here. Um, and I think I might need to go to, to the stages of this and, and then ask for the logistic regression model. I'm, I'm probably off on this. I'm, I'm just winging it here. Um, Paran map and and this might might allow us to get it. Yeah, yeah. No, we can't. Um, we we can't do that. Okay, I'm gonna have to come back to that uh, if we have time here. But there's a few other things I want to cover here. We should be. But the basic deal here is there's two confusions. One is we have a model that's fitted, and there's a question of whether we need to go to the estimator versus the model. The second question is. The model and the estimator are pipeline models and estimators. And what we actually want is the component in that that's for the logistic regression. So that's why I want to come back to this uh, uh, in a bit, if we, if we have time. Um, question about the FAST model. Yes. Is the FAST model being faster? Correct. So Correct. 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 Model. Correct. And that's based on this evaluator. So the question was, how is it picking the best model? Basically, it's picking it best on this based on this evaluator that was used when we defined this cross validator um, uh, component here. And this evaluator function was used across these different parameter values, combination of parameter values to select which metric is used. And that metric is summarized here for each of the combinations of parameter values, okay? And that is used to identify the best model. Now, I believe one could quite readily um, reach in to the results and grab out any of the models. So you could reach in and grab the worst performing and the best performing if you wanted to. But this one that is referred to here as the uh, best model is, a, is the one that is performs the best according to these metrics. And those metrics are ones we specified as part of saying that, hey, we want to use area under the RC curve. We could have we we could have said something else. But this binary classification evaluator that we um, set up here, there we actually said use area under the ROC curve. Um, there are other options for metric name that, that would have been possible. Yeah. Um, for example, you might use, you know, might optimize for sensitivity or specificity or optimized for recall. Maybe there's a, um, Maybe there's a F1 score, or um, maybe there's a, a accuracy, you know, sort of crude accuracy. I think any of those um, might well be a part of what's featured as uh, in the uh, the set of possible metrics. Yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, I yep. think it works if you take out the parent. Oh yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's. Ah, okay, here we go. Um, so so that's fantastic. You notice it found a regularization param of 0.04 and a tolerance of 0.01 to be most effective. When we had first tried it, we had used a regularization parameter 0.2 and a tolerance of 0.001. Um, so it looks like it preferred the same tolerance, but a different regularization param, right? Um, and, you know, based on that, if I 
had my druthers, I'd probably go back and and expand this a little bit. I might look at some around 0.4, like 0 0.0, 0.1, 0.0, sorry, point zero point three and zero point five, and maybe I'd look a few things close to but lower than like 0 0.0005 and 0 0.0015 and just see if some of those are better. But uh, Luana is the hero. That's that's great. Good job. Good job. Um, uh, okay. Uh, nice, nice. Um, okay, so I'd like to now um, do the following. Um, we we got our model. We found the best model here, and Luana helped us print out the characteristics of that model. Now, I would like to take that model. By the way, so that model is a model, it's a pipeline model. Um, or, yeah, this model is a pipeline model. And Luana extracted the logistic regression model from that um, because that's just one element of the pipeline to print out its param values. Here we go. Logistic regression model from cross-validation here. Um, I would like to now take this model and I would like to transform the data set, the full data set, DS all tweet text. After all, we did cross-validation with it, tenfold cross-validation. We've selected this model. Now let's go through and classify all of them right, as to what it thinks they are. There we are. And, and this will be called val, it's a data frame, df predicted from cross validated, you could write CV if you want to, logistic regression, you could write LR if you wanted to, regression model. There we go. Um, okay. Uh, there we are. So it bears noting what we got out from this whole cross-validation process, what we got out is a model. It's, it's the best model. It's a model that performed the best. So we fitted it and we evaluated it against, we tested it against the other subset of the data and it performed the best. So it's a model, it's not just an estimator, it's a model, and as a model, it can transform data and get data out. So it's a complete, honest to goodness model, not just an estimator, right? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a model that, that uh, performed, uh, performed the best, okay. Um, and, uh, here we go. Uh, we're going to take this and and actually that that troubles me a little bit. I because we got out a model. Like which model is it? Like which on which subset of the data is this one trained? Right? Th there's an important question there. And it may be that what we actually want is we want its parent, which is an estimator, but with the same params, and then train it on, you know, a more complete subset of the data. But um, I'm a short, and so we're going to take this, and so this is um, the um, evaluated one. So I'm gonna select the probability and the prediction and the label, and I'm going to show 100 of them. There we go. Boom. Okay. Um, and uh, here we actually have a uh, degree of agreement that's not overwhelming. Uh, to say the least, uh, we see um, there are some that can. It, we'd have to we'd have to look at why this is because I see some that are like 0. 0.6, which 
where it treats it as a zero, even some 0.79 treat as a zero. And then some that are very small, like 0.37, where it treats it as a one. And I'm wondering if it's if it's reversed there. What's that? It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Um, and what would be especially interesting is if we could select the text here, right? So if we go the text, I don't know, it's going to be really big now. I hate being sick. <laughs> so so, um, so that that is labeled as one. It it predicted zero, maybe because it had hate in it or something like that. Um, I have been ill. Well, okay, this is not this is this is not terribly uh, inspiring as classification. Um, Britain's military history <laughs> classified as health related as one, um, uh, and 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 yet searches medicine is zero. So um, we'd have to. I, I want to evaluate this a little bit more. I'll revisit this because it. It's not clear to, that this is uh, a terribly, um, um, terribly uh, um, competitive model right right now. Um, show, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. With a bracket. Uh, With, with false okay sure sure oh okay um okay yeah so that's a little bit more um a little bit more helpful okay that's actually really nice you have um so here it shows the two sides ah okay i think before it was showing as luana guessed it was showing only the probability of not being sick and now it has the probability of being sick as well, right? Um, uh, but these are um, these are are not hugely impressive in terms of classification. I'm guessing it is a strong bias for saying it's not sick when it should be. So it's it's probably not highly. It's probably not highly sensitive, but it's quite specific. So when it says it is, uh, perhaps it is, because Yuan is right, uh, like pandemic influenza, yeah, it got that right. But it's probably missing a lot. So it's probably have a lot of false negatives that it's classifying. A lot where it's saying it's not, but it really is. But hopefully that means, and to get that score of 0.7, whatever, or 0.8, 813 or whatever, 814. It it probably means it's highly it's it's uh, highly specific. So at least when it says it is, it really is. It's not predicting a lot as being health related that are not. It's just it's very it's very parsimonious in saying that's health related. It's very it's overly hesitant in saying it's health related for those that are. Okay. Um now finally we could do logistic regression model from cross-validation. We could write it, dot overwrite, and save it in an output file called health recognition, rec recognition model, under bar, and I'll say, um, uh, April 3, uh, 2018, here we are, and I'll, I'll make that more obvious. So the point is this output is just um, immediately followed by the slash there. Now, if we do that, um, we could then go and find that model in the output folder associated with Docker. So to do that, we'd have to use, and I'm going to need uh, a bit of assistance here from uh, uh, UJ or, or Bopo. Is it Docker exec? Is it exec? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Docker exec uh, uh, Zeppelin. Um, 
dash it after exec yeah i can't remember it bash oh uh bash but uh zeppelin then bash yeah okay cool okay cool and then if i do oops output here there's my model right um and if you go look in at the health recognition model you could see the stages and the metadata about it um there we go um and as is traditional for spark these are um these are stored in a way that uh that is sort of labeled uh, within these folders, um, reflecting they may be output from many machines. Um, and uh, I'm one, I don't know for a fact if these are in, uh, in text, but yes, it looks like it is, and it documents uh, some information, and then there are some stages uh, associated with this as well. Uh, you notice that this is, what do you think that is? It's for what? The... Yeah, it's for each stage of the pipeline. This is for the tokenizer. This is for the stop word remover. This is for the vector. And this is for the logistic regression. Okay. So um, this is actually not an absolutely horrible way to, uh, to explore, you know, uh, aspects of the metadata associated with this uh, as, as, as well. So you notice here, for example, are the various parameters um, the threshold that it was using and the regularization parameter and the tolerance and et cetera. One thing, by the way, that could be changed there quite fruitfully, we didn't make it a member of our parameters, but to create a more responsive model would be to change the threshold. Um, it's possible that that would, uh, uh, that could yield uh, effective results. Okay. Um, that's all we have time for today. So next time we're going into, um, bit of stuff on futures and future actions um, within Scala and Spark uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much.